here to talk about a pro bono uh, project that I did uh, last year, but I was actually working at the Food Standards Agency at the time. So I did it um, in conjunction with three of my operational research colleagues at the Food Standards Agency, David Milson, Darren Holland, Abdul Khalid. It was very much a collaborative effort, but they couldn't be here today, so you've got me talking about it. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, really briefly about pro bono, what pro bono OR in the third sector is, just in case there are people in the audience that haven't really come across it. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the charity that we worked with, Action West London, but the main focus of the talk is going to be the methodology and the implementation of the actual project. And then I'm going to finish off talking about the, what we recommended and some of the outcomes of the project and also reflecting back on what the experience was like um, working in the third sector for a really small charity and trying to apply operational research in that kind of context. Um, so pro bono, I think most of you have probably heard of pro bono. Or, um, so I won't ask that question. I was going to ask if you'd uh, heard uh, how many people in the audience had heard of it, but I think I'll just skip over that. So um, the pro bono scheme, just really briefly, was launched by the OR Society in 2013. It's a really successful scheme. It's been running for about four years. Um, it's basically about placing um, OR um, practitioners, academics, anyone that's got those OR skills, an OR professional, basically um, putting them in touch with charities to be able to help them improve, uh, make operational or strategic improvements. Um, and it's done on a pro bono basis, so completely free for the charity. There's lots of different types of projects um, that come out as, a, um, as part of the scheme. So there's things like decision making, evaluation, efficiency improvement, process improvement. Yeah, should come in. <laughs> uh, and um, data analysis, etc. And I think our project was um, sort of a mix of quite a few of these. So we had a bit of process improvement. Um, some strategic planning, some efficiency improvement, and we tried to do some data analysis, but that was kind of one of our main barriers in terms of they really didn't have much data, but I'll, I'll come on to that later. So the process is quite simple. So um, if you join the OR Society mailing list, then they mail you lots of different uh, projects and you can um, basically um, bid for one and you submit a short proposal, which is what you're gonna do on the project and kind of a bit about your background, like a short CV. So um, I really wanted to do something that made a difference. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I've done charity work outside, but it, this was like a great opportunity to actually use my professional skills for doing something charitable. But I was a bit apprehensive about doing it on my own. Even though I've worked in um, OR for a long time, I was still like, well, I haven't really worked in a charity sector. I haven't worked for a small organization. What is it going to be like? So I thought, well, in the government, there's lots of operational researchers. I work with some at the, data, um, at the Food Standards Agency. So I kind of convinced my team to, do, to submit a bid as a, a group. And the way I kind of sold it to the Food Standards Agency and my manager was that we're going, it's kind of upskilling ourselves as well. So a lot of the project was quite soft OR, which we weren't doing enough of, I felt, at the Food Standards Agency. So this was like, well, we can pr almost like practice um, and also do good at the same time. Um, I remember Ruth's talk about not making it about yourself. So just to, just to say that bit. Um, so yeah, so we, we submitted a bid. Um, we kept a lookout and we were kind of looking for a project that enabled four people to work on it that was the right time scale for what we needed. So in the civil service, you get three days volunteering, non-statutory paid volunteering days a year. So we were able to use that and that between the four of us, we had 12 days. So we were kind of looking for that kind of project. We wanted something London based. Um, I don't think it's essential to be based in the same city as the, as the charity, but it just made things easier for us. And there, there is actually a lot of um, availability in London. So we were lucky. So we came across, um, so we submitted a proposal and the charity that we wanted to work with was Action West London. They're a small charity based in West London. They started off even smaller. They were, used to be called Acton, uh, Action Acton, um, and then they expanded within West London. And they basically provide um, employment, education, enterprise training for um, people from dis like disadvantaged backgrounds. So people have been long-term unemployed like for more than four years. Um, people who've just come out of custodial sentences. Uh, people who, um, a young black men was one of their projects as well. So a range of things, and they also work as part of the work program for, for DWP, so placing people that way. So we all kind of felt this was a, a, like a really good cause and we wanted to get involved. We submitted a proposal and then we had, um, once our proposal was accepted, and I like to think we um, kind of fought off lots of other bidders, but I, I fear we may have been the only people that submitted a proposal. Uh, so uh, we, won, we won the bid anyway, and uh, we had a first initial scoping meeting with the 
chief executive had commissioned the project. And I think I, it's really, really critical to get that initial meeting right because even though they, they've kind of got in touch with the OR Society and they've been given some guidance on what OR is, it's not, they don't really know necessarily what you can offer and how you can help them. So that initial scoping meeting really helped us to, to iron out exactly what it is we, can, we could offer them. And they'd kind of, they'd bought, um, so the project was about improving their employer engagement. So it was about how do they make, um, how do they kind of get the right vacancies to place the client? So the client is the person that they're trying to get the job for. Um, so it's the person from the disadvantaged background and then the employer is the, the, the person that provides the vacancy. So it really was about how do they better engage with the employers that they're working with to place their clients. And they'd bought a, like, um, a tool which was called My Work Search, which was basically to enable their clients to look for work through that and that recorded what jobs they were applying for. And their idea was very much fixed in terms of can you come in and kind of implement the system. So we were like, well, we're not IT specialists and that's not really where we excel and that's not really where we can provide the value. So that really, that scoping meeting was about what can we as operational researchers really help you in the, the very limited time scale that we had. So we kind of divided the project up um, into two strands, um, which was one was about process improvement. So how can they make the processes that they do within the organization more efficient? And the second was improving the quality of data that they have on employer engagement and collecting data and then using that to then evaluate how well they're doing um, the placement of the, of the clients. Um, so we worked two people on each of these. Um, so David and I did the process improvement strand and my colleagues Darren and Abdul did the uh, looking at the data that was available. So talking a bit about the process improvement strand. Um, so we started off um, running, we'd proposed two workshops. The first workshop was going to be about what is the current process? And the second workshop was going to be, well, how you, this is what you currently do. How can you actually improve that? So we wanted to try some kind of uh, soft systems methodology techniques. So we started off with rich pictures. We'd invited um, almost everyone in the organization that was involved in employer engagement or placing clients. So this, was, uh, this ranged from the chief executive down to the volunteers. So we had them all in a room. And we, told, we kind of said the aims of the workshop and we started them with rich pictures. And if anybody's done rich pictures, it's, it's, there's quite a spectrum of people and how they deal with it. Like some people are really visual, they'll be like, they'll get on with it. And some people will just have a blank piece of paper and they'll just, they'll just sit there and they'll be like, what am I supposed to do? So we had that whole range of people there and we started them off as individuals saying, um, draw what you think the charity does. And we kept it really broad. Uh, we didn't say specifically about employer engagement. And after about five minutes, one person in that workshop actually walked out. She, she was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And she just went back to her desk and started working. And I think she thought this isn't a valuable um, use of my time. So we kind of just let her go when we concentrated on the people that did actually want to engage. And after they'd done their individual maps, we um, got them to got, go into two groups and combine their maps. And it's quite interesting what they came up with, these two kind of very different visuals of what the charity does. So the first one is sort of uh, the one on the, your left is uh, a road or a river that kind of flows to so the client comes in, they've got a black cloud hanging over their head with a lightning bolt, they're kind of depressed, and then Action West London's represented by that house and they've got the hearts, like they're really welcoming to their clients and helping them on that journey. Then the sun, the cloud starts going away from the sun and then it kind of, the end goal is, um, you know, when they're placed in a, an employer, in a um, vacancy and they're happy and, and they're employed. And, all the kind of benefits associated with that and the goal. And then the other one was very much more focused on these faces and what, what are we doing? What are the steps and how do we get there? Um, so it, by that stage, when we got them into the groups, they were really engaged. Um, so that was really good to see. We then, I'm going to go over this really um, quickly. Uh, there were lots of other steps, but basically we translated those maps um, into a process map. And we did that by asking them to come up with on post-its all the activities that go on at um, Action West London related to for very much from when the client comes in to when they're placed in the vacancy. Um, and this is kind of what came up. And I'll just, um, these are the detailed actions that they came up with. And through conversation, we kind of grouped them together and saw which ones came up a lot, which like if there were repeated post-its, those were the ones that were really important. And basically just um, uh, summarizing it, um, a client will come in, they'll be given information, advice, and guidance. There'll be um, a focused job search based on that particular client. 
and then there might be some optimization depending on um, if the client says what they, they want to go for a particular um, field or job and then working up their CV, maybe finding training opportunities for them, then optimizing that client work set. And then from the other side, the green box is about getting the vacancies from the employers. So they even did things like walk around Acton, looking at um, like job adverts and windows and things and sourcing um, ads that way. So it's very much a very local, small charity. And then some of these employers would you then get repeat business from. So if they um, place somebody there, then they'd, um, uh, they might then use that employer again in future. But what, what's really clear from this process map is that this process was happening almost at the client level. So every time a client came in, they'd be doing this for that particular client. There was no centralization of their processes. And a lot of that was driven by the fact that people were really almost selfish about their vacancies because they had to meet targets. So one of the main ways that they got funds was through the work program. So, and that's very much target based. So each project manager felt like they had to place a certain number of um, um, uh, clients into jobs. So when they got a job vacancy, even if it wasn't that relevant to their client, they sort of kept it just in case and they weren't sharing it. So that became really obvious. So we kind of um, said, well, the the, it's very clear that what we really need to do is have a mu much more centralized um, focused job search. So when the client comes in, they provide the information and um, guide the project managers provide the information and guidance. And then um, there's like a centralized way of um, both of sourcing vacancies, storing those vacancies and allocating the vacancies. So then it becomes this map. And we presented this back to the chief executive and a couple of other people for validation. Um, we then had a second workshop, which was about identifying issues. Um, this was just a, a brainstorming session. They came up with their issues. We identified two key issues, which was lack of communication and not getting the right vacancies. Um, and then we did the, an Ishikawa or a kind of a root cause analysis, which is basically about asking why. Um, so lack of communication, why is there a lack of communication? Well, there's a scattergun approach. Why is there a scattergun approach? Because there's no system. Why is there no system? And we went down and it worked really well. And one of the people in the workshop had actually come across this before and he'd used it. And he came up to us really enthusiastically and said, well, I'd like a bit more detail on this process because this is something I want to use with my staff. And then finally, we did the solutions for, for the root causes, and we divided them up by management versus people who are actually working on the ground, because we wanted people to be really free with their ideas and not feel um, stifled with what they could say. So this is just the Ishikawa diagrams um, written up. Um, we then had a final validation meeting with the operations director and one of the project managers saying these are the proposed solutions everyone's come up with validating those like will they work in practice and then what are the further questions that we still need to think about and we presented these back in our final report so some of our recommendations making employer engagement more centralized appointing a, an employment uh, employer engagement officer um, having an integrated information management system and having more clear responsibilities Sorry, I'm rushing through this a bit. The second one was data analysis and, and looking at what data they needed to collect to make it, um, evaluation possible. They had four main data sources or data collections. And by that, I just mean spreadsheets, like one spreadsheet. Um, and we looked at them and kind of tried to do some data cleaning and give some recommendations on what, um, what they could do with that data. So they had, they had started an employer engagement worksheet They'd started using that, um, that tool I talked about, my work search. They had a caseload spreadsheet. They had data on placement information, but it was only with the work program. And that was the only reason they'd recorded at that is because they had to. Um, we also had a meeting with a work program project manager to explain this data. And one of the big barriers was he really wasn't on board with this project. And he just didn't, he wasn't even really sharing the data. So that was really hard. Some high level issues, a lot of the data wasn't centralized. Each team was keeping their own records. There's no clear ownership. There's no in, uh, agreement on how to use the contacts in the employer work sh uh, spreadsheet. There was a lack of quality assurance and the information was being used operationally rather than strategically. So just things like even pointing out like the fact that they were, when they were recording things, it was free form. So it was really hard to tell which job sectors people were going to because warehouse was spelt or recorded really differently. Um, a job sector spreadsheet contained information on, on the clients as well, not just on the job sector. Um, one of the things we did, we looked at number of placements um, by the job title and cumulative um, percentage, and then it becomes really clear that people, most of the placements are in under one or like um, 13 job titles accounted for 50% of the placements. We also looked at some of the businesses that, that had repeat, um, that they'd used again and again for employment. 
Um, and then you can tell here that they've kind of almost stopped keeping records because it stops. It's not like all of these have stopped working. So something must be going on here. So these kind of things we pointed out. We did some work on seasonality, um, but the data was really noisy between years to be useful for planning. There do seem to be some peaks in terms of vacancy seem to come up in summer and at the beginning of autumn more than any other time. So we recommended that um, there needs to be more centralized data collection. There needs to be the focus of employer engagement on particular sectors that uh, the clients have the skills and ability to actually work in. Um, they needed um, better use of data for evaluation and forward planning. And just to finish off, so um, reflecting on was it worth it? Um, so I think it really was. And I think one of the main things that came out of it was the, the engagement throughout the process. In the beginning, the fact that the chief executive was really on board, but the people in the organization weren't necessarily. But by the time we finished the first workshop, they actually came up. They said, oh, we want to take a photo and tweet about this. And it was really nice that they actually they said that, the great employer engagement workshop last week from food Gov experts. And they're all really enthusiastic. And um, the recommendations that we um, suggested were actually implemented. It was a bit lu of luck in, in a way, because they actually won two big contracts um, at the time that we submitted our report. And that enabled them actually to fund the employer engagement officer and things like that, which in the beginning they were saying we can't really do because we just don't have the money. So they were on board with the ideas and then the funding enabled them to actually implement it. Um, so yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.